Hi everyone, it's Mr. Mendez. So I decided to make a video on lesson uh, chapter 15 for the seventh graders uh, for world history. And chapter 15 is African civilizations. Now my plan is to make videos that would you guys will be able to watch while you guys look at the Google Slides. Uh, just so one, I can read the text and two, I can add a little bit more information to what you guys are reading on those slides as well. All right. Uh, so this video won't cover the entire chapter is going to be going by lessons. So chapter 15 is African civilizations and lesson one of chapter 15 is the rise of African civilizations. Now, one of the reasons why we I usually include this chapter uh, with our history lessons is that normally in other textbooks, when they talk about uh, Africa or they talk about people that lived in Africa, um, they go really fast. They normally pay attention to the accomplishments, the importance, and the power that those empires and cities and civilizations had in Africa. So I want to go a little bit more into detail uh, in this entire chapter. Uh, so lesson one is the rise of African civilizations. Uh, now, the first thing you got to know is that people had lived in Africa for a very, very long time. Uh, currently, scientists believe that the first humans appeared in Eastern and Southern Africa between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago. This was around early human groups. And her, early human groups in Africa lived as hunter and gatherers. You guys learned about that uh, last year in sixth grade, what a hunter and gatherer uh, were. Um, these early people actually moved from place to place to hunt and gather and find food. And around seven to 8,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers in Africa began to settle, began to stay in, in small areas, and they became known as villages. Uh, in those areas, they ended up taming and domesticating animals, and they ended up growing different types of crops for farming. Uh, and the first thing we have to understand after those early beginnings is the geography of Africa. Remember, you can follow along in the Google Slides. So the geography of Africa. So unlike other civilizations that we have studied in this class, you know, those civilizations we're talking about cities or small little countries or small little geographical areas or regions. Africa is a continent. It's a, it is the second largest continent in the whole earth. Um, uh, but it's mainly, it is mainly made out of four geographic zones. The first one being a desert, Mediterranean, rainforest and savanna savanna being like a tropical grassland dotted with small trees and, tr and shrubs so those are the four types of zones in africa uh and because you all had all those different types of zones you'll end up having civilizations that ended up changing the way they lived in order to succeed in those uh those th uh, zones and most people, when they think about Africa, they either think about a jungle, which doesn't really exist there, not the way that people think, or they only focus on the deserts there. And when they only focus on the deserts, uh, they only focus on the civilizations of Egypt and maybe the civilization of the Kushites, uh, which is really unfortunate because there's so many other people that lived in Africa. The Egyptians didn't hold the entire continent of Africa. But most people just study them, which is very unfortunate because you had so many other cultures that were uh, just as important as them or even more so. Um, as part of that geography, how Africa looked like, you also had other landforms and, uh, and rivers. So most of Africa is actually covered by a series of plateaus, which are like high uh, areas of high and mostly flat land. Uh, many large river systems are actually found in Africa. So Kush and Egypt... Uh, those those civilizations actually flourish in the banks of the Nile River. You guys have learned about that in the past. Uh, the Niger River in West Africa actually led to a civil to a village and town growth through trade and farming. It was a really good area to find good soil to build a community there. Uh, people living in the south of the Sahara, south of the, of the desert, also learned to make iron. You had lots of raw material there. And something that you'll learn uh, in this particular chapter and actually in other chapters of different civilizations is that the people that would come to Africa 
saw that the continent of Africa was so rich in minerals and in metals and so many other raw materials that they ended up taking advantage of it. And that's not to say that the people in Africa did not use it as well. It's just as soon as colonialism and imperialism started coming in and all these invasions, they started ransacking and taking away all these raw materials, these valuable materials like gold, silver, diamond, oil, uh, salt, uh, copper, things like that. So things that they would use to create very strong civilizations. They would take it out of Africa and they would take it to other places in Europe, in Asia, uh, in the uh, Middle East, Middle Eastern world, like in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Um, so those are very, really good things to remember. Um, so the people that lived in these areas were very skilled. Uh, there was th that skill of being able to use iron uh, spread from east to central Africa to north, I mean, to west Africa. So being able to use these metals and to mine them became very important. And around 250 BC, uh, Dijnan Jero emerged as the largest trading center in West Africa. And in that area, that trading center, they ended up trading um, iron tools, gold jewelry, copper goods, and pottery. So again, a lot of raw material, a lot of like precious metals. Uh, and because of all this trading, you end up getting these trading empires in Africa, these civilizations that once they stayed in one area and they saw, oh, we have gold and we have salt. Awesome. We'll be in charge of that. And then you, had another, you have another area. Oh, we have iron. We have copper. Awesome. We'll be in charge of that. And then you have another area. We have salt and we have pottery. And let's say we have diamonds or what or anything like that. They'll be in charge of that. And so they'll have all this power to create these empires of trade. So they'll be able to share that or they'll be able to negotiate on like, can I get more land? Or if I don't have any land, I'll sell you that land if I get more gold, different things like that. Um, so yeah, trading empires in Africa. Um, hot and dry Sahara isolated North Africa from the rest of the continent. Uh Around 400 BC, the Berber people of North Africa, Africa found ways to cross the Sahara to West Africa. This is a major step. Prior to the introduction of Asian camels around the 200 ADs, most animals, sorry about that, most animals like donkeys and horses couldn't really survive the desert heat. It just wasn't the best type of animal to have when you were going to travel in caravans. Uh, camels, on the other hand, could survive the harsh conditions of the desert with hardly any food, minimal food, uh, and water. Their feet were also well suited to walk in the sand, the way that they would land in the sand and all that pressure would kind of space out. That heat will also uh, space out as well. So those animals, those camels, wouldn't be suffering suffering in the middle of the desert. Um, so then we move on to West Africa. So in, Af in West Africa, the tr they had trade of gold, Ivory, which is what uh, elephant tusks are made out of, pottery, slaves, ostrich, feathers, and all those trades actually increase power and influence. Now, I know I mentioned slaved, uh, slaves. What you gotta understand is slavery back then did not mean uh, did not mean the same way as slavery uh, when talking about uh, U.S. American history. Slavery back then were people that were captured during war were being captured when they were uh, invading other civilizations. So once they captured those people, they were treated as slaves. They had to work um, in order to get out of slavery. They were able to marry other people. They were able to uh, buy things. They just had to work their way out of slavery because they lost to a battle or anything like that. That's completely different to slavery seen in the U.S. Um, throughout its history of slavery being very tied to racism uh, and where, you know, they weren't allowed to work their way out of slavery. You can't, you hardly saw the kind of things. And the reasoning for that slavery was based on race compared to the reasoning in the reasoning in slavery in Africa, in West Africa was based on, oh, they lost the battle. All right, they're going to be working for us until they can get out of it. This is completely different types of slavery. That's not to say they were, you know, one's better than the other. It's just that, they had different contexts. Um, so yeah, around the 700s uh, AD, Berber and Arab traders brought Islam to West Africa. And as a result, a lot of people ended up becoming Muslim, ended up following 
um, Arabic culture. Uh, again, this goes back to the previous chapter of they saw Islam as, hey, we could succeed in doing the things we, we want to do. And a lot of the things that they believe, we also believe as well. So we might as well practice Islam. Um, so you actually saw a lot of people, in S a lot of Africans in West Africa uh, become uh, Muslim or Islamic. So uh, from around the 500 ADs to around the 1300s uh, AD, so around 800 years, uh, these African empires grew bigger uh, than most European kingdoms in wealth and size. Something you're going to realize is that most of the power that came to Europe, most of the power, most of the wealth, the jewelry, the gold and all that stuff, they did not get that until they ended up invading Africa. So before all those invasions, the civilizations and the empires in Africa were the ones that had all this power, had all this wealth, and they had such a rich history with it. They had so much power that they they uh, they controlled. So yeah. Uh, so the next uh, next slide it goes into how did Ghana begin. So one of the first empires we're studying is the Empire of Ghana. So Ghana was the first great trading empire in West Africa. It's around current day Sudan. Uh, the area was mostly grassland with really good fer uh, fertile uh, soil and iron ore, which is very important. Uh, they were also located between the Sahara salt mines and the gold mines near the coastal rainforest. Now, something you got to realize is that when people traveled with meats and other uh, organic material, it had to last the travel to get there. And one of the ways that, uh, let's say, uh, meat or stuff that they hunted would last a long time is they would end up mixing it with salt. It preserved it. Uh, and, you know, salt actually made things taste better. So salt was actually a really awesome commodity to have during that time. And, of course, gold throughout history has been seen as a very precious metal um, so Ghana was actually in a really awesome place to start with. One, they were able to create uh, awesome farmlands. And two, they had access to really good places of mining. Um, so yeah, trade was the key. It was the major key. Uh, traders invested in salt or gold, uh, interested in salt and gold, had to pass through Ghana at a price. So if anyone wanted to, that wanted to mine or wanted to trade for salt or gold, they actually had to pay to get into Ghana. So that's actually one of the smart moves that the Empire of Ghana started doing, saying, hey, you're more than welcome to walk through. You're more than welcome to, to mine at these salt and gold mines. But you got to pay us in order to do so. It's kind of like nowadays when you see a McDonald's, you see a Walmart, you see a store open up. If, whenever they open up in an area, there's usually another company that owns that land that they're going to open up. So let's say they opened up at McDonald's at that uh, at that piece at the corner of, of your street. There's probably someone else, another company or another store that owns the ground that McDonald's is going to be built on. And so once the McDonald's is built, that McDonald's has to pay whatever they make. It has to pay a, an amount of money to whoever owns that land. So in the same way that, uh, in that same way, the the Empire of Ghana was okay with people trying to mine gold or try salt, mine salt, except they had to make sure to pay to get in. Uh, it was almost like a pay to win in order to access that salt and mine uh, gold mines. Um, so yeah, it was a, uh, Ghana was also a great source of iron ore, and they were able to have control of West African gold mines. Uh, it's kings, Ghana's kings had a well-trained army to enforce order. So using the wealth and power that they had, they started to beef up, started to strengthen their military as well. Uh, and people were willing to pay any price for salt. It was, like I said before, it was great for flavoring uh, the food that they ate. And it was a great preservative, uh, preservative in order to keep things fresh and to last longer. Uh Ghana ended up reaching its height of trading power in the, around the uh, 800s AD or 900s AD. Uh, that was the very, very peak of their power they were to reach. Uh, Muslim Arabs and Berbers brought Islam through trade. So, you know, because Ghana was able to let people go in and out, 
Evangeline, the Arabs, were, which were known as really these awesome traders, were able to go through that empire, the Ghana, uh, Ghana Empire, and bring Osla, uh, Islam to that area as well. So the next slide, the rise of Mali. So during the 1100s AD, AD being after zero, uh, the uh, invaders from the North Africa area disrupted Ghana's trade, causing the empire to fall. This, unfortunately, even though Ghana spent most of its its money trying to beef up its military, it was not strong enough to, to defend itself from these invaders. So in the 1200s uh, AD, uh, a Mali state ended up conquering Ghana. Uh, West African uh, storytellers say a great king named uh, Sundiata Tieta uh, united the Mali people. And after he united the Mali people, he built this great military uh, to conquer different areas. Uh, this king's conquest put Mali in control of the gold mines in West Africa, which was a very important spot to have. Uh, Mali built its wealth and power on the gold and salt trade that previously uh, the empire of Ghana had. So it, it, you saw this like shift in power to another type of people. Um, so the next thing, the next slide that we're going to is how did Songhai begin? Songhai is a different empire. So as Mali weakened after the death of its major king, the King Mansa Musa, around 1464, so 1464, Sunni Ali became the ruler, ruler of Songhai. He ended up seizing control of the Niger River and its neighboring salt mines and gold mines. So again, salt and gold was where to go for power. Around 1490, uh, 1492, Songhai was the largest empire in West Africa. Uh, again, they had control of the salt. They had control of the gold. They had control of basically of all trade that most people wanted to get. Unfortunately, invaders from, the, from North Africa, again, ended their empire around 1600 AD. So you had this change of power again and again and again, all basically just to make sure that they had power over the, the salt and gold mines. Um, so yeah, the West African kingdoms ruled the savannas. They kept changing in power uh, ever so often. The, the rainforests also had their own kingdoms. They were just not as big as the ones in West Africa. Uh, so you had the kingdoms of Benin and Congo. They just weren't as big as, you know, Mali and Ghana uh, and the Songhai. Um, so yeah, if you actually look at your uh, Google slides, there's going to be a picture of the continent of Africa and the trade routes, the trade paths that they would follow uh, and where those gold and salt mines were located. Um, and when I say gold and salt mines, I don't mean like they just, the gold and salt were just everywhere. It wasn't like really easy to get. That's why in the beginning, the empire of Ghana was okay with people coming in um, because those people still had to try to find the gold. It wasn't always... Uh, uh, 100 percent they're going to get it right away so that's why they charge people to go in because no matter what they were going to get the money letting people in but the people let it, uh, going in it wasn't a for sure thing that they were going to get gold or salt right away um so one of the last slides is called east african kingdom so we're moving to the east side of africa so that side um in ancient times powerful kingdoms arose in east Af uh, east africa Kush, thri Kush thrived on the Nile River for hundreds of years. Uh, those were the southern neighbors of the Egyptians. We studied them uh, last year uh, with the sixth graders. Um, another kingdom became known as the Kingdom of Axum. It was actually near, uh, located near the Red Sea. Uh, they had trade routes that linked Africa with the Mediterranean and with uh, India. So they were actually one of the few kingdoms that started trading outside of the continent. They started trading with other people that had different types of goods. So they didn't really focus so much on gold. They wanted to see what else the world had to offer. Um, but this was one of the, uh, again, one of the few kingdoms that ended up trading. They made a lot of ivory, meaning they killed a lot of uh, elephants to take the tusks, the ivory. Uh, they found a lot of incest, in, uh, which is basically things that really smell really good. Um, make sure the places smelled fresh. And they sold a lot of enslaved people. Again, they conquered a lot of places. And if they didn't feel like everyone was useful, they would just trade them off to become slaves. 
Uh, in return, once they traded those kind of things, they would bring back cloths, different types of clothing, metal golds, and olive oil. This is through the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so around 300 AD, King Anzana conquered the Kush. They ended up taking over that empire and using it for their own purposes. Um, once they took over that empire around 334, that same king made Christianity the official religion of Aksum. Um, it, but eventually, because it was very similar, Islam was introduced later and became more popular just because the rules and the, the tradition and the practices weren't as strict or weren't, weren't as serious. Um, and then still sticking to the east coast of Africa, you have the coastal states around the Indian Ocean. Around the 600s AD, uh, AD, Arab traders from the Arabian peninsulas had reached East Africa and they be, uh, began starting, they began trading between each other. Um, around the three, uh, 1300s, a string of trading ports were created along that coast. So you had uh, Mogadishu, Kiwa, Mombasa, and Zan, Zanzibar. So again, I'm probably going to be butchering some of these words, but I want to make sure you guys have a close pronunciation to them. Uh, so when you see them on your quiz or your assignments. Um, and one of the last uh, empires we'll study is Zimbabwe. Now, this empire of Zimbabwe, uh, their territories were rich with deposits of copper and gold. So instead of having salt and gold, most of their imports, I mean, sorry, most of their exports, the things they were sending out while trading was gold and copper, things that would be really useful when it came to the military and when it came to trading with for other things along the Silk Road and around uh, trade routes that the Arabs were going through. Um, so they would uh, trade copper and gold for, for things in return like uh, silk, glass beads, carpets, pottery, minerals, ivory, and coconuts. Interesting. Um, so the very, very last slide of lesson one is going to be showing you guys a chart with those uh, five major empires, Aksum, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and Zimbabwe. When they were in power during that time, what uh, was traded, what are the things that they got out of the ground, and just some key facts about them. All right. So like I said before, uh, these lessons are going to be divided among videos. So lesson one, two, three, and possibly four when it comes to different chapters. Okay. Uh, make sure to watch this video as you are looking at the Google Slides. It'll be helpful, and you guys will be able to do the quizzes much easier. All right? Take care.